Nostradamus published a famous book of prophecies in 1555. Some people like to praise him for having predicted the future. Allegedly, he foresaw all kinds of things about world history. With a bit of imagination, you can see him speaking about Napoleon, Hitler, uh, God knows what else. Of course, for every one of those uh, pseudo-truths that you can imagine yourself finding in his text, uh, he also said a hundred things that turned out dead wrong. People are less excited about those parts and easily forget about them. It's easy to be a prophet that way. If you're allowed a thousand guesses and people only count the ones that came true. Galileo is another Nostradamus. He too threw a thousand guesses out there and hoped that one or two would stick. Like Nostradamus, Galileo's reputation rests on his admirers having a selective amnesia, remembering only those rare occasions when he actually got something right. And that's our thesis for today. So uh, let's have a go at uh, Galileo's catalogue of errors. Uh, a bunch of them have to do with the law of fall, supposedly Galileo's strong point. Uh, but in fact, if we just Galileo's grasp of the law of fall by the way he applied it, then uh, we must conclude that uh, he did not in fact understand the law of fall very well at all. Uh, he gets it wrong more often than not when he tries to apply his own law. Here's one example. All objects fall with the same acceleration. But how fast exactly? Uh, what is this same uh, universal acceleration that every object shares? The answer is well known to any student of high school physics. The concept of acceleration, the famous uh, lowercase g, as we used to write it, is approximately 9.8 meters per second squared. Uh, Galileo, he messed this up. He gives values that are equivalent to less than half of the true value. According to his defenders, I quote, clearly round figures were taken here in order to make the ensuing calculation simple. In other words, Galileo used arbitrary data. That's again a, a quote. And these things are, uh, you know, what people who are trying to defend Galileo are, are saying. Isn't the law of all supposed to be one of Galileo's greatest discoveries? Why did he use fake data then? Why not use real data? It was readily doable. His contemporaries did this, the necessary experiments and measurements. Uh, why not do a little extra work and get the details right when you're publishing your supposed key result in a mature treatise, as Galileo did with this fake data? Is that really too much to ask? Instead of uh, reporting make-believe evidence with a straight face, which is what Galileo is doing. Um, competent and serious readers like Mersenne and Newton, for example, and others were all in disbelief at Galileo's inaccurate uh, data. They certainly did not think that it was fine to use arbitrary data in order to get round numbers for simplicity. Uh, nor did they think it was clear that this is what Galileo was doing, contrary to what Galileo's defenders are forced to try to argue when they do their best to excuse his inexcusable behavior. Mersenne put it very clearly. Here's what he says. I doubt whether Mr. Galileo has performed the experiment on free fall on a plane, since the intervals of time he gives often contradict experiment. Ah, yes, indeed. Mersenne, he was a serious and diligent scientist. He did the necessary work to find the correct value of gravitational acceleration, unlike Galileo. So, as usual in this episode, as in so many others, Galileo's supposedly scientific treatises are actually uh, popularizing polemics and little else. To actual scientists, what he has to say is disappointingly shallow and it lacks serious follow-through. Well, here's another error Galileo made with his law of fall his so-called uh, piece and drop theory of planetary speeds. The planets, they orbit the sun at different speeds. Mercury, it has a small orbit, it sips around very quickly. Saturn, it goes a long way around, it has a big orbit, and uh, also is moving very slowly as well. Um, Galileo, he imagines that these speeds were obtained by the planets falling from some faraway point toward the sun and then being uh, somehow deflected into their circular orbits at some stage uh, during this fall. That supposedly explains why the planets have the speeds that they do. Uh, I'll read the Galileo's description from the dialogue. It goes as follows. Suppose all the planets to have been created in the same place, descending toward the sun 
until they have acquired uh, those degrees of velocity which originally seem good to the divine mind. These velocities being acquired, suppose that the globes were set in rotation around the sun, each retaining in its orbit its predetermined velocity. Now, at what altitude and distance from the sun would have been the place where the set globes were first created, and could they all have been created in the same place? To make this investigation, we must take from the most skillful astronomers the sizes of the orbits in which the planets revolve, and likewise the times of their revolutions. So using this data and uh, the natural ratio of acceleration of natural motion, that is to say the, the gravitational constant g, uh, one can compute at what altitude and distance from the center of the revolutions must have been the place from which they departed. So according to Galileo, this calculation shows that indeed all the planets were dropped from a single point and their orbital data agrees so closely with those given by the computations that the matter is truly wonderful, as Galileo puts it. But uh, Galileo omits the details, though, in his uh, treatise. He has one of the characters in the dialogues say that uh, making these calculations would be a long and painful task and perhaps one too difficult for me to understand. That's Galileo's mouthpiece in the dialogue also confirms that the procedure is indeed long and difficult. Actually, there's nothing difficult about this at all, at least not to mathematically competent people. Mersenne, he immediately ran these calculations. He found that Galileo must have messed up. The scheme doesn't work. There is no such point from which the planets can fall and obtain their respective speeds. Uh, later, Newton made the same observation. Galileo's precious idea is so much nonsense. Evidently, he must have based it on an elementary mathematical error in the calculation because it just doesn't add up, his claims. Here's another example again involving the law of fall. Uh, Galileo wished to refute an ancient argument which uh, goes like this. The earth does not move because beasts and men and buildings would be thrown off due to the rotation of the earth. So let's investigate this idea. So let's just picture an object placed at the equator of the earth, such as, let's say, a rock lying on, a, on an African savanna. So you can imagine this little rock being thrown off by the Earth's rotation, what would that mean exactly? It would mean that the rock would take the speed that it has due to the rotation of the Earth and it would shoot off with that speed in the direction of a tangent uh, line of its motion. So uh, the spectacle will be underwhelming. Uh, since the Earth is so large, the tangent line of the motion is almost parallel to the ground. And since the speed of the rock and the Earth are the same, they will keep moving in tandem, in parallel to each other. So rather than shooting off into the air like a cannonball, the rock will rather uh, slowly begin to hover above the ground, just like a few centimeters at a time. And this, of course, uh, does not actually happen to, to an actual rock because gravity is pulling it back down again. The rock stays on the ground because gravity pulls it down faster than it rises due to the tangential motion. This is the right way to think about it. Uh, how can we uh, compare those two forces uh, quantitatively? It, that's easy. Since we know the size and rotational speed of the Earth, it's is something that uh, you can give it as an exercise at the high school physics uh, test to calculate how much uh, the rock has risen after, uh, say, one second of moving along the tangential speed, ignoring gravity. And that comes out as about 1.7 centimeters. And this needs to be compared then with how far the rock would fall in one second in that same time due to gravity. And again, it's a standard uh, high school exercise. It's just, uh, you know, the gravitational acceleration constant g, and you can easily find this. And the answer comes out to be 4.9 meters. So this is why the rock never actually uh, begins to levitate due to being thrown off. Gravity easily overpowers that very slow ascent uh, many times over. But... This conclusion depended on the particular size and speed and mass of the Earth. That's how we got those numbers. We could make the rock fly off, in fact, by spinning the Earth fast enough. For example, if I run the calculation again, assuming that the Earth rotates, say, 100 times faster, then we will find that instead of rising that measly 1.7 centimeters above the ground in one second, the rock instead 
soars 170 meters uh, in that same time. And remember, the fall from uh, due to gravity was 4.9 meters. It doesn't put much of a dent in in that uh, 170. So indeed, the rock does fly away in that uh, scenario. Galileo, alas, he gets all of this horribly wrong. Even though we were supposed to celebrate Galileo as the discoverer of the law of fall, it's apparently too much to ask that he would work out this very basic application of this law. As we noted uh, before, Galileo does not offer a serious estimate for the constant of gravitational acceleration, the G, the letter G, unlike his contemporaries, who were proper scientists like Mersenne. Um, for this reason, he did not have the quantitative foundations to carry out uh, this analysis that I just gave it to high school students. They can do it in five minutes, but uh, Galileo could not. But worse than this, Galileo maintains that actually no such analysis is even needed in the first place. Because he can prove, as he says, that the rock will never be thrown off regardless of the rotational velocity of the Earth. There is no danger, Galileo assures us, however fast the whirling and however slow the downward motion, that the feather or even something lighter will begin to rise up due to this effect. For the tendency downward always exceeds the speed of projection. Galileo indeed he pretends to offer a, a geometrical demonstration to prove the impossibility of extrusion by terrestrial whirling. Those are uh, the quotes from his big treatise on this. Galileo's claim to fame as a mathematizer of nature has certainly done no favors by this episode. He doesn't know how to quantify his own law of fall. He doesn't understand basic implications of this law. His physical intuition is categorically wrong on a qualitative level, and worse than that of the agents that he's trying to refute, actually, whose stance was really quite reasonable, would have been accurate if the Earth was spinning a, uh, a bit faster. Galileo even offers a completely wrong-headed geometrical proof that the agent's conception is impossible, even though uh, so-called Galilean physics, who could today call Galilean physics, actually leads to the opposite conclusion in an elementary way. Galileo's error, in fact, uh, amounts to assuming that speed in free fall is proportional to distance rather than to time. A crucial distinction in Galileo's law of fall, the so-called Galileo's law of fall. Galileo and others uh, got this wrong at times. It was an important uh, step. By messing up that exact point then, in his mature work, Galileo is certainly very much undermining his claim to be the rightful father of the correct law of fall. And uh, in this episode, Galileo also makes another independent error in this connection when he claims that the Earth has the same whirling potential as, for example, a wheel with the same rotational period. So in other words, what he's saying is that centrifugal force doesn't depend on radius, only the period. So uh, as one scholar observes, Anyone familiar with simple merry-go-rounds will know that this is false. And just picture it for yourself. Is it really just as hard to hang on to a speeding carousel whether you are close to the center or right out at the periphery of the thing? Or alternatively, think of the pottery wheel that you use, so shaping some clay, making a ceramic pot. Uh, suppose you put a piece of clay. Is it really equally likely to be thrown off this wheel by the rotation if it sits near the middle as if it sits uh, near the uh, edge? According to Galileo, the answer is yes. You, you can judge for yourself how plausible you think that is. Here's another example. Galileo tried to compute how long it would take for the moon to fall to the Earth if it was robbed of its uh, orbital speed. Making the computation exactly, as he says, according to himself, that is, he finds that the answer is 3 hours, 22 minutes and 4 seconds. It's completely off the mark, not even close, because Galileo has assumed erroneously that uh, his law of fall, so the constant gravitational acceleration, extends all the way to the moon, which of course it does not. Ironically, uh, Galileo's purpose when making this calculation was to refute the claim by another scholar, a contemporary, who had claimed that the fall would take about six days, which is a much better value. In fact, it would take the moon uh, almost five days to fall to the earth, according to modern science. So that's Galileo for you, the great hero of quantitative science, uh, bombastically claiming to refute others with his exact calculations, as he calls them, only to make fundamental mistakes 
and uh, are orders of magnitude worse than his opponents. Here's another example. A rock dropped from the top of a tower. It falls in a straight line to the foot of the tower. But uh, its path is not actually straight if we take into account the Earth's rotation. Seen from this point of view, so from a coordinate system that doesn't move with the rotation of the Earth, so looking at it from a fixed point in, in outer space, then what kind of path does the rock trace? Galileo answers erroneously that it will be a semicircle going from the top of the tower to the center of the Earth. Here's what he says. If we consider the matter carefully, the body really moves in nothing other than simple circular motion. Just as when it rested on the tower, it moved with a simple circular motion. I understand the whole thing perfectly and I cannot think that the falling body follows any other line but one such as this. I do not believe that there is any other way in which these things can happen. I sincerely wish that all proofs by philosophers had half of the probability of this one. So very ambitious words there. Those are characters in Galileo's dialogue uh, expressing their enthusiasm and conviction with Galileo's argument and supposed proof. In fact, uh, in reality, all of this, these claims are inconsistent with Galileo's own law of fall. Once again, he doesn't understand basic implications of his own law. Mersenne, again, readily spotted uh, Galileo's error. Uh, Fermat, his uh, friend, observed that uh, the path should be a spiral, not a semicircle. And when his embarrassing error was pointed out to him, Galileo replied that uh, this was said as a jest, as is clearly manifest since it is called a caprice and a curiosity. That's Galileo's uh, so-called defense. Some defense, that is, uh, far from offering a sonnery in testimony, Galileo actually openly pleads guilty to the main charge. That is to say that his science is a joke, which is what I was claiming all along. Here he is, uh, in fact, saying that himself as a way of defending uh, his errors. If he really did mean it as a caprice and a curiosity, then why did he say in the quote I just read that he uh, considered the matter carefully and sincerely wished that all the proof of philosopher have the probability of this one, etc., etc.? He always says uh, cocky stuff like that. Just look back at the errors I already mentioned uh, today. All of them came with those kinds of bombastic claims where Galileo is editorializing about how remarkably convincing his own arguments are and uh, uh, made exact calculations, it's uh, geometrical proof, etc., etc. He always says stuff like that. So, well, isn't that convenient, you know? You throw out about sort of half-baked uh, guesses. When they turn out right, you can claim credit for stating it with such confidence. Whereas uh, a more responsible scientist may have been exercising prudent cautions and, and uh, have taken a more balanced view, that person would then not get credit for this discovery. Instead, it goes to Galileo, who uh, very bombastically and assertively claimed that discovery. On the other hand, when the guesses turn out wrong, you can apparently just write it off as a joke. I say, oh, I was just kidding. Pretend that that was what you intended all along, even though you published it with all of those extremely assertive phrases right in the middle of your big definitive book uh, on this very subject. You know, it's uh, very easy to be the father of science if you can count on posterity to play along with this uh, double standard. Okay, so much for the law of fall. Let's look at some of uh, Galileo's other physics errors. So, as we have seen before, uh, Aristotelians were often as inclined to experiment as Galileo. That's a point that uh, is obscured by Galileo's pretenses to the contrary when it suited his purposes. But elsewhere, it suited Galileo better to feign uh, other straw men. As Butterfield has observed, in one of the dialogues of Galileo, it is Simplicius, the spokesman of the Aristotelians, the butt of the whole piece, who defends the experimental method of Aristotle against what is described as the mathematical method of Galileo. So that is a very true description. And here's an example of this. The question of whether the resistance of the medium, such as air or water, uh, how it influences the, the motion of a body. And Aristotle has stated a law regarding how a body uh, moves faster in a rarer medium than in a dense one. That's what Aristotle claimed. Galileo, in an early text, 
criticizes Aristotle for accepting this for no other reason than experience. Instead, one must employ reasoning at all times rather than examples. For we seek the causes of effects and these are not revealed by experience. That's also a quote from Galileo. Alas, despite his avowed allegiance to reasoning, Galileo's own law as to how resistance depends on density of the medium is itself incompatible with classical mechanics, as one modern study puts it. That's a polite uh, scholarly way of saying that it's wrong, of course. And employing some more reasoning along the same lines, Galileo decided that uh, air resistance doesn't really uh, increase appreciably with speed. The impediment received from the air by the same movable will move the great speed is not very much more than that which, uh, with which the air opposes it in a slow motion. That's Galileo saying these things. That's a surprising conclusion to modern bicyclists, among others. And yet, according to Galileo, experiment gives firm assurance of this. This is what, this is what he promises us. Uh, once again, as modern scholars have observed, the statement is false and the experiment adduced in its support is fictitious. So there you go, more fake data. This is quickly becoming a pattern. The pendulum. It's a case that is similar in this regard. With regard to the period of oscillation of a given pendulum, Galileo asserted that the size of the arc, that is to say the, uh, the height or of the starting point of the pendulum, as you release it and it starts to swing back and forth, the uh, size of the arc, the height, does not matter for the uh, periodicity, the time it takes to go uh, back to a starting position, according to Galileo. In fact, in reality, it does matter. Galileo is wrong. Galileo's allegedly experimental report on pendulums in the discourse is clearly fabricated. It is exaggerated, to use a diplomatic term uh, preferred by certain scholars on this subject. Um, Galileo's friend, uh, Guidobaldo del Monte, he performed the same experiments. And when he told Galileo that uh, he was mistaken, Galileo uh, rejected those measurements. And instead he kept insisting on his own claim. So instead of admitting what experiments made by sympathetic and serious scientists had showed, Galileo preferred to defend his false theory with uh, what one historian calls conscious deception. <laughs> it's perhaps more commonly known as lying. Here's another example. Uh, the shape of the hanging chain, like a necklace suspended from two points. It looks deceptively like a parabola. Uh, but it is not. Galileo fell for the ruse, though, as he says, and I quote him, fix two nails in a wall in a horizontal line, from these two nails hang a fine chain. This chain curves in a parabolic shape. That's those are Galileo's words. More competent mathematicians, of course, uh, proved him wrong. Christian Huygens demonstrated that the shape is not, in fact, parabolic. Now, we must admit that this proof of Huygens is from 1646, so it's four years after Galileo's death. So you may consider Galileo saved by the bell, as it were, on this occasion, since he was proved wrong not by his contemporaries, but only by posterity. It is not really fair to judge scientists by anachronistic standards. On the other hand, Christian Huygens was only 17 years old at this point when he proved Galileo wrong. So another way of looking at it is that a prominent claim in Galileo's supposed masterpiece of physics was debunked by a mere boy less than a decade after it was published. In any case, uh, Galileo does uh, ascribe to the catenary, the shape of the chain, the same kind of shape as the trajectory of a projectile. So he considered this to be no coincidence, but rather due to a physical equivalence of the forces involved in either case. And indeed, uh, Galileo made much of this supposed equivalence and intended to introduce the chain as an instrument by which gunners uh, could determine how to shoot in order to hit a given target. And Galileo, he also tried to test experimentally whether the catenary is indeed parabolic. To this end, he drew a parabola on a sheet of paper and he tried to fit a hanging chain to it. And his note sheets are preserved. They still show the needle holes where he nailed the endpoints of the chain. And now the fit of the chain, it was not perfect. Uh, but Galileo, he did not uh, want to discard his cherished hypothesis. Instead of questioning his theory, he evidently reasoned that 
the error was due merely to secondary practical aspects, like such as the link, the links of the chain were uh, too large in relation to the measurements, something like this. And therefore, he tried it with a longer chain, and he found uh, the fit was better that way. And so, with this kind of uh, fiddling with the data, he evidently convinced himself that he was right uh, after all in his hypothesis about the parabolic shape of the catenary. So the, this the, this uh, episode of the chain clearly undermines uh, two of Galileo's main claims to fame. First, it brings his work on projectile motion into disrepute. The composition of vertical and horizontal motions that we're supposed to admire in that case, in the case of parabolic motion, will certainly look a lot less penetrating and perceptive when we consider that Galileo erroneously believed it to be equivalent to the vertical and horizontal force components uh, acting on the catenary which is incorrect. And secondly, Galileo's reputation as an experimental scientist per excellence, it's certainly not helped by the fact that his experiments in this case led him to the wrong conclusion, evidently because uh, of the love of his pet hypothesis led him to a biased interpretation of the data and sweeping under the rug of the experimental falsification. So, well, those are two conclusions we can draw from the hanging chain episode. Here's another example. The Brachistochrome problem. This is the challenge to find the path along which a ball rolls down the quickest from one given point to another. Galileo believed himself to have proved that the optimal curve was a circular arc. The swiftest movement of all from the terminus to the other is through the circular arc. That's Galileo. Actually, the fastest curve is not a circle, but a cycloid. But this was only proved in the 1690s using quite sophisticated uh, calculus methods. So fair enough, we cannot blame Galileo for not possessing advanced mathematical tools that were developed only half a century after his death. Nevertheless, this error is one more on his pile of erroneous assertions about various uh, physical curves and problems. We are supposed to celebrate Galileo for being the first to discover the parabolic path of projectile motion and conveniently forget that at the same time he was wrong on the brachistochrome, wrong on the catenary, wrong on the isochrome, etc, etc. With all these errors stacking up, you may be forgiven for beginning to wonder whether the one thing he did get right was anything more than uh, dumb luck. Galileo's accounts of his correct discoveries certainly may sound very convincing and emphatic, but knowing that he was equally sure of a long list of errors, it certainly gives us reason to suspect that uh, some of the things he got right are to some extent uh, guesswork propped up with overconfident rhetoric in the hope that readers will mistakenly take his case to be stronger than it is. Okay, so that's it for today. And I, we have still only dealt with Galileo's physics. His astronomy is a whole other can of worms with a parade of blunders all of its own. But uh, we'll get to that uh, another time. Thank you.